Go ahead. Yeah, welcome everybody. I think most of you have switched over 19. So welcome to the community call of KCP April the 19th. And we have two demos as far as I see today, plus uh, the usual topics about issues, incoming issues. So let's start with uh, Cockroach, Steve. Cool, so I just wanted to give a, a quick update on uh, the Cockroach benchmarking work. Um, so, is, Super quick background in case people um, weren't in some of the other meetings. So I'm looking at what does it take to use uh, CockroachDB as the backing store for Kubernetes and as uh, follow on KCP. Specifically, we're looking at high scale use cases where you know previous KCP iterations would have thought about tessellating multiple NCD instances together. Um, I've got a, a couple links in the comment. One is a repo where I have my uh, benchmark set up data acquisition sort of stuff. Um, oh, sorry, let me also, oh, I will add a link to the document where I'm uh, uh, putting down like what kind of uh, testing I'm doing and, and why. Um, I got some feedback on the doc, um, if you, have you know thoughts of different benchmarks that you want to see or, or specific things you want me to investigate please please let me know um and i have uh, preliminary results today um for two tests uh i wonder if this is going to let me share uh so the, the first test while i'm figuring out screen sharing is um the setup is basically start a server. Uh, we're going to have the store in HA mode. You know, we're not storing anything in in um, in memory. Like, there's, there's all these different options that uh, make the store look a little bit more like. A, a test or a fake rather than a, a real thing. So I'm trying not to use any of those. Um, so start a Kubernetes API server, start either etcd or cockroach in HA mode with all the best bells and whistles that we know about turned on. Uh, then the first thing that the test does is it loads uh, five gigabytes of data into the, um, into the storage. So in this case, uh, if I remember correctly, we're using a hundred kilobytes of filler data inside of a pod, and then we're just posting however many uh, five hundred thousand pods or something. Um, and then once we have uh, a database size, uh, we start doing uh, a bunch of client activity. So in this case, we're looking at a hundred parallel clients, and then there's a ratio of one to ten write to read. Uh, so in this case, that means we have uh like one create you know oh, i can look it up but i think it's one create one delete two update and then however many gets to, to round that out um so basically we the actual size of the data doesn't change very much um, we just do a bunch of churn um, and then what i'm measuring is the actual client res client request response times um and then also the server load required to to do that uh, and so in this case, on the left, there are, you can think of these basically as histograms. Um, and so create performance is fairly equal between the two. Delete, you know, CRDB has a slight edge on the long tail. On gets, CRDB is much faster than etcd. On updates, CRDB seems to be a little bit slower. Um, and then on the right, because the CRDB gets were so much faster and we're doing a one to 10 write to read, the CRDB test actually finished Thirst. Um, so the x-axis is is time here, uh, and we're seeing that you know Cockroach is pretty good at keeping its working set under control, um, but it trades that off for a bunch of CPU intensive work. Whereas etcd, you know, doesn't take very much CPU to run. However, uh, the working set balloons to 12 gigabytes across the three etcd instances for a five gigabyte database size. Um, fairly quickly. Just to be clear, this is the sum of the memory sizes of these yes. processes. Okay, for both. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, so this is the sum for both. 
Now that doesn't make sense to me because um, if you said five gigabytes of data, wouldn't the sum be 15 gigabytes? Um, all I can tell you is that this is the data that C Advisor gave me about the okay, containers on my, on my workstation. Um, <laughs> the, oh, well, the other question, of yep. course, with at least with uh, etcd and i guess logically with crdb as well right there's the history uh, trimming or compaction um, yes what, what's the compaction behavior in this test um i believe this test ran for just under five minutes and so it was not uh, readily apparent that's something that i intend to focus on in a future test thank you um, yeah, also, uh, to be super clear, like, please jump into that repo that I linked uh, if anyone wants to reproduce these. Uh, everything from, you know, starting the containers, getting the data, plotting it, all of it should be, you know, sort of one button push in there. And if it's not, then, you know, please let me know. Um, so one thing I'll note, uh, I'm still looking at a potentially better visual visualization for this. Um, as the actual size of the database grows, the... Uh, edge for CRDB increases. So when we're looking at single replica deployments with 100 megabytes of data, etcd is, is very efficient. Um, as we start to get to these enormous sizes, CRDB comes out on top, at least in my testing. So um, I'd like to capture that in a different visual. Um, but for now, uh, we have this. Uh, Stefan? Do you plan any? Sorry, you're, you're muted. No, yeah. Oh, um, do, do you play, do you plan anything about a much bigger working set, like I don't know, a terabyte of data across many nodes? My um, question is around how does locality of data work in CLDB? So I, I guess the answer to this probably comes in two parts. First, as of now, I've been running this locally. I only have sixty-four gigs of free system memory. Um, I can only do tests up to that scale until I start working on, you know, if I try to automate like AWS bring up or something. Um, and then on top of that, etcd wouldn't exist at those unless you found an instance that had a terabyte of RAM. No, I'm thinking more about running this on, let's say 50 or 100 machines against the same database. So etcd has a natural partitioning, which you, I mean, you have 100 etcds in such a use case. But yeah. he would have one CADB, right? And yeah. locality and you can, something which, yeah. It's it's a good question. Um, and the, there are a bunch of tools about asking Cockroach to distribute ranges across uh, geographic areas. I have not looked into that yet. Mike, you had your hand? Yes, yeah, Stefan said something, referred to something I'm not, well, not, not aware of. Uh, he said uh, etcd has natural partitioning. Uh, by virtue of having a different etcd in each partition. Net, yeah, it's natural in the sense that it's explicit by the administrator. <laughs> in the sense of... Uh, one 100 etcds, everybody has 5 gigabytes. So it, data it, cannot move. It's it's in the one etcd it is in, right? There's no movement. But TDB can move data, and it's not clear whether there is any stickiness of data to nodes or something like that. Uh, okay, right. So you mean KCP has got this sharded architecture? It's it's not something built yeah. in. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, right. The, the, yeah. Um. So, yeah. Again, I'm just learning about cockroach. Also, um. Yet, yeah, it's is there some automatic shifting of data, or, or is I thought it was explicitly managed the 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 sharding in K, in cockroach. Uh, there's like a manual the size of a book on it. Um, so I don't really want to <laughs> poorly try to summarize anything, but you have a, quite a lot of, of uh, tunability as an administrator. And I, I don't, I can't really speak to more than that. I haven't really investigated it yet. All right, thank you. Um, so if we're so, lucky, so my, oh, my, my th thinking is that I was assuming that you know, sharding means that the shards operate uh, independently, which means that the time travel is going to operate independently, which means that the resource version in Kubernetes becomes a version vector rather than a single number. No. So Cockroach's hybrid logical clock is global. 
Now that sounds like a scalability bottleneck. Perhaps. Um, when we do the test, we'll figure it out. Be, yeah. Um, I think also intelligent partitioning of data and access would, would help there. Um, so if we're lucky, okay, great. This, uh, oh, sorry, before we go on, uh, any other questions or comments on this benchmark? Cool. Um, so the next thing I looked at uh, was basically, you know, cockroach, SQL, have indices. Um, what happens when we actually use indices? And so what I did for this test was, you know, fairly simplistic and definitely not like, this is not what I think the final solution should look like. But, you know, in Kubernetes API, um, there's a set of interfaces that are implemented by both the storage layer and uh, upstream caching. And the caching has indices and the constructors are all the same. So I basically took the indices that are currently used in the watch cache and I plumbed them into the storage. Um, and then Cockroach can look at it and say, oh, okay, I'm writing a pod. I know that the pod has this index. I'm going to go ahead and explicitly um, write you know, a separate table that also has this index set up. Um, if somebody is using Cockroach, for instance, without uh, quote unquote data encryption at rest from the Kubernetes side, they would be storing raw JSON blobs or whatever. And in that case, um, I think there's an even more performance solution here where uh, you're using uh, implicit indices based on the, the structure of the JSON. That's an interesting avenue of investigation. I haven't looked at it yet. Um, so what we're looking at here is very explicitly, these are indices that were created at uh, create or update time. And then we're, we're looking at if I create uh, a whole bunch of data, and then I'm doing lists against it, and my lists have a field selector. Depending on how selective my field selector is, what does my performance look like? And so here, I think we're selecting everything from one item out of 500,000 to uh, whatever, 40% of it. And as you can see, like the more selective your query ends up being, we're orders and orders of magnitude faster than the API server on NetCD um, because we're able to offload all of the selection onto the database instead of having to load all of it into memory and then do the filtering. Um, and then at enormous, so you know when we're talking about a list as a field selector that selects 40% of all pods here, we're talking about um, like 200 megabytes of data and we start to see the times converge. I, I imagine that's mostly um, data throughput. Derek? Yeah, what was the actual value? So are you selecting secrets or other large content here? Or what is it that you're actually listing? Uh, we're, we're selecting pods by node name. And each pod in this test is one, it's a basically a tiny pod with an environment variable that has a kilobyte of data in it. Any chance you ran the same test with like something closer to a metadata, like a secret? Um, I could do that, yeah. Okay. Let me I'd just be down. curious if the transfer then starts to overweigh. Um, well, this is neat. Uh, also, to be clear, we're looking at uh, performance without paging and without the watch cache. Um, obviously, if you let the API server hold the entire data set in memory and you're serving the whole thing from memory, then the watch cache is fast. But you're looking at cockroach performance here with zero memory overhead on the API server. Cool. Um, so one really exciting thing about this test for me is there's a whole bunch of conversation from many years ago about uh, allowing people to um, define generic field selectors, uh, especially on CRDs, with you know a database that's somehow aware of schema. This sort of thing at least has legs. Uh, in the CD case, obviously, 
the solution is to hold everything in memory and, and do an index there. Um, Derek, you have a question? Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I wanted to make sure I understood. Uh, uh, I'm assuming that all content eventually at rest will need to be encrypted by some customer managed key. And so are you saying that that being the case, uh, we would still get these performance benefits and it's only in the case where it wasn't encrypted, you could get even better. I just want to make sure I understood. Uh, well, so today Kubernetes has a very unique approach to encryption at rest um, where Cube is encrypting the data at the API server level and passing it down. I'm sure you yeah, know that. that. Just for right, it's just um, the key thing to me is that the customer can manage their key. Right. So it's I think a customer a customer managed encryption key at the cockroach level would not stop cockroach from being able to do implicit indices uh, or you know inverse indices on like JSON data there. It's just um, if we hand cockroach a bunch of encrypted bytes, it's not going to be able to do anything with it. OK, but in the KCP multi-tenant scenario can you selectively choose which keys are encrypting at which level i believe so yes and i i would also hazard a guess that encryption at the database level would be sufficient like it's sufficient in general and the cube approach is kind of weird so in, in any case um this even as an explicit thing so what we're doing here is basically taking the cache functions computing the indices at the cube level and just doing raw inserts. Um, like that would work either way. Mike? Yes, I was also wondering, um, again, the question about the CPU, right? You've offloaded. Um, so uh, did you look at what, hap what happened to the CPU uh, as you offload this work? Uh, I can, I have the data, I can plot it. Um, I didn't look. I imagined it would be similar to before. Yes, thank you. Do look. I think it'd be interesting. Have you cool. thought about the implications of having no watch cache? I mean, the indexing doesn't happen in memory. That's clear. What about events? And looking back in history, when you resume a watch, is I'm it sorry, practical? I understand the question. Is it practical to run a big cluster, Kubernetes cluster, without watch cache if we just have those indexes from the database? Or is there anything we lose beyond indexing in memory? So, uh, so more concretely, the watch, the actual watch part of the watch cache that's holding onto 100 events per type, there's no reason that that shouldn't be possible. Um, furthermore, the watch cache today, like the list cache inside of the watch cache, is very useful as a deserialization cache that could become a tunable cache that we say, okay, you know, we would like to allocate a couple gigs to deserialization caching. Whereas today it's only possible to cache every object at once. Um, so I would imagine that both of those being tunables would allow you to get, you know, whatever performance you were looking for based on my understanding of where the watch cache is most useful today. But as far as like resuming watches and correctness semantics, I don't imagine we'd have any impact. You're muted, I think. Stefan, you're muted. I was saying, um, even today, it's just best effort, whatever is served from the cache. The newest data is just returned, even when the client wanted to have something old. So it shouldn't harm, I think, if we go to the database directly. Yeah, I, I actually remember reading that now, um, especially, yeah, there's uh, on gets, that's the current behavior. And we could, we could have a partial watch cache, right? That's what you are saying. 
yes. partial in the sense if it's not there, if there's a miss on, on, on read, then we just go to the database. If we have it cached, we just return it. Yeah, I think so. the benefit of not doing indexing in memory is that, like, obviously, you can only serve an indexed list from memory if you have all the data. And so if we relax that, then all of a sudden it's um, easier. Um, cool. So uh, again, um, there's a link to the doc uh, in, in the comments. I would love to hear more, more thoughts. Um, I tried to note down the stuff that you guys mentioned, Mike and Derek. Um, one of the things that I'm going to be working on today is looking at uh, server performance um, under high uh, watch load uh, and also looking at uh, event delivery latencies. That's all I've got. All right. Thanks a lot. Great update. So let me continue. Right. So we have more topics. Next one is Andy with an update about API exports and identity, I guess. Yes. Uh, so last week um, and maybe the week before, I spent some time fleshing out some of the additional functionality that's in the uh, Epic for API uh, schema exporting and binding. So I have a demo to show. Let's see if this is going to work. Uh, Can you all read this OK? Yes. All right. So uh, the demo that I want to show today is starting off by putting on my um, API service provider hat, so to speak. So um, the example that we've been using throughout um, our planning has been with Cert Manager. I'm not demoing Cert Manager today, but imagine that I wanted to provide something like certificates and APIs for certificates to other users. And I don't want them to have to um, worry about getting Cert Manager or any operator installed. They just want the APIs. And then from the uh, from my perspective, since I'm writing a controller or an operator and I want to see all the instances of uh, just my type or my types that I'm exporting, I need some way to do that. And so I have a virtual workspace for that that um, David has put together a really good starting framework for making that pretty easy to set up. So let me start. And I'm going to switch to a workspace that is called Foo. And if we look in here, um, I have an API resource schema. Uh, this one, I, I was playing around with some um, trying to make sure that we couldn't have any sort of uh, identity hijacking. So the name here is a little strange. but uh, so there's an API resource schema that represents uh, the API group andy.io, and the resource is called dashed endpoints. I happen to be testing if you could have a dash in the resource name. So if we take a look at this uh, in YAML, it's, oh, let me skip over that. Um, so what you'll see, it looks a lot like the custom resource definition. The spec has a group. It has names for the kind the list kind, the plural, the singular, what scope it is, uh, how many different versions it supports. This is the schema for the core V1 endpoints resource, just because it's relatively small and what I was playing around with. And if we get down to the bottom here, that's just the end of the schema. There's uh, not much else. So it looks very much like a custom resource definition. It's just a different type uh, and a couple minor changes here and there. So the, that's my API resource schema. Uh, you'll notice that in, in my workspace, I don't actually have any CRDs. That's because I want to be able to eventually evolve and have different versions of my schema that add new fields, maybe make some breaking changes. And you can't really do that easily with CRDs, but we can do it with something that looks just like CRDs, and that's the API resource schema. The next thing that I need to do so that other people can use my dashed endpoints resource is to export them. So I have an API export here. 
that if you take a look at it, um, it has a name, dashed endpoints. It has a, in the spec, it references uh, one or more API resource schemas by name. So this is a direct name reference to the API resource schema we were just looking at. And then uh, one of the things that I've added in a series of branches and PRs is this idea of an identity for each API export. And the identity is what makes it unique from other exports beyond just name. And it we eventually will have code in place that makes it so that the identity for an API export represents a contract, meaning that uh, consumers of the exported schemas won't have breaking changes uh, in their APIs. And it's also used as a way for the API controller author, which is me in this case, uh, to pull down and retrieve all instances of just my dashed endpoints um, CRs without colliding with anybody else who maybe is exporting the exact same group and resource and version. So with these two in place, the API resource schema and the API export, I can now switch to a different workspace. Uh, this Andy workspace is taking on the role of a, a consumer. So this person is not installing any pods that are operating or controlling these dashed endpoints. And if we take a look at the API bindings, you'll see I've created an API binding here. And what I did, um, I can give it whatever name I want. It happens to have the same name as the API export that we were just looking at, but these names don't have to match. And what you'll see is that the controller has come in and said, uh, okay, there's an Andy.io group, there's dashed endpoints, and then there's a schema that has a UID, an identity hash, and the name. And we keep track of the storage versions from that API resource schema. So with all of this in place and we see the conditions, it's ready, the API export is valid, the APIs are bound, and the phase is bound, we can now manipulate dashed endpoints within my workspace. So if I, uh, see if it works. So I've created a dashed endpoint called test one. And if we uh, take a look at what this is actually doing, you'll see that it's going to the root default Andy logical cluster and it's asking for dashed endpoints inside of my default namespace. So this is me as a, as a user or a client interacting with this API directly. But what about the controller author who probably is not going to have access to uh, get into my workspace or any other user workspace and look at their CRs? So what we have is, one. Uh, hold on a second. This is services. Okay, here we go. So we have a new virtual workspace at slash services slash API export. And then there's a series of path segments that represent the, um, the workspace or logical cluster that the API export is in. Dashed endpoints is the name of the API export. This hash is the identity. And then the rest of the URL is a normal URL for any sort of query that we might want to do. So I can do a wildcard um, get or list against all of the dashed endpoints in all of the workspaces. And what you end up with is a list. Uh, there's only one item in it right now, but you see the cluster name is root default Andy. And nowhere in my query did I ask for root default Andy. So what this is doing is it's saying, because of the wildcard character here, it's saying go to any, any workspace within KCP in the control plane that has uh, Andy.io v1 dashed endpoints, 
matching the identity hash and uh, API export and the name it, or the workspace that it came from. So if somebody else were to export a dashed endpoint resource, it would not show up in this query. If, um, but it, this will show all of the instances across all the workspaces that have bound this particular export into them. So um, that's the bulk of the demo here. Um, what we have left to do is um, getting a couple of PRs in place in front of this before I can open up a PR to do the virtual workspace. And um, I haven't addressed anything related to authorization yet. So everything that I've been testing is just running as the root user who has um, full access to everything. So we definitely need to address that. And then one other thing that we'll want to do is it's extremely likely that a controller, in addition to wanting to see whatever has been exported, it probably needs to see config map, secrets, other things that are not just the exported APIs. And so we'll want to find some way to allow the um, API provider to, to declare, I need to pull in everything that has been exported plus secrets, config maps, and whatnot, and ideally have it be a subset of whatever types they're asking for so that it's just like we don't want to give people read all secrets across all workspaces when you may only need just a certain subset of them. So um, that's what I've been working on. Uh, expect the PRs to get updated over this week and hopefully done this week too. Um, and that's what I got. So I, Nick, I saw your hand had gone up briefly. Did you have a question? Yeah, um, more of a, a comment on a parallel with the problem that we have been trying to um, pan out with authorization, uh, really, really configuration in general for um, operators in OLM against like a regular cube cluster. So like the, the problem is um, as I uh, sort of expand the constraints of the operator um, or expand its view over a cluster, in terms of like the namespaces it can watch and uh, the things it can do as more and more users onboard. Um, how do I uh, provide that information to the operator, uh, to um, I guess the cluster admin or whoever is like expanding those privileges? Um, and so, like, we really generalize the problem to like any sort of configuration. It's any, it's uh, like an operator author can provide a, uh, a, a basically a template um, and it, it templatizes their config as a bunch of other cube resources that get applied to the cluster. Um, so I am very interested to see how that like really generic approach could like pair up here where it's just like, um, uh, a, a template of resources that you apply in, in the operator um, or whatever controller. Let's not use the word operator, let's use the word controller. Uh, the controller requires, because you could imagine like um, it requires some secrets in the workspace to be generated in order for it to work, or it needs not just RBAC, um, et cetera. So, uh, I might put up an issue. Yeah, I think it would be um, helpful if we could set up a time for you to walk me through that. Uh, I'm not super familiar with it. So um, yeah, if we can take any lessons learned and carry some of those designs forward and get them merged in here, I think that would be pretty beneficial. We have some ideas. I mean, if the names are static, known in advance, we can, of course, put that in some policy or some permission claim or something like that. The interesting part comes when a CR or an object references another one, like a secret ref. So we might want to, to 
point with the JSON pass or something like that, with a secret ref, and then the pointed object is automatically visible or something like that. So if you have ideas around those lines, very welcome. So let's see what you have done there. Maybe there's a fit here as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, we can. I think we should uh, probably talk about that in that modeling session. So uh, what we definitely we don't want. Um, a controller, just because it has to read one secret, shouldn't see all the secrets because there might be a thousand customers behind, right? So we know what we don't want, but we need, we have to find something to formulate that, to specify that. Yeah, um, the the trap that I think we fell into like very early in the design of OLM that we had to like fix later on was really, we thought it was all about RBAC and scaling out RBAC and maybe secrets um and it was all doing that up front so like you configure your tendency up front and then um that our back would be like uh generated and spit out to whatever namespaces that configuration uh had but um we kind of realized that uh, it, uh that it's not just permissions it's not just our back it's whatever resources that like a controller might need to be generated to work with a, a specific namespace um so you take that up one level to workspaces and logical clusters could be applicable uh, all i'm saying is that we probably shouldn't like over specify we probably want it to be as generic as possible if you have pointers Please post them in the Slack, maybe. Or we, we make a meeting, as Andy suggested. Yeah, I put down a to-do on my reminders list to touch base with Nick and folks. All right, questions, comments about the topic? That was super cool to see, Andy. Thank you. So the background, I'm not sure everybody got this. Um, we wanted to get rid of the wild cards, especially Steve mentioned that a couple of times because of those reasons that you can hijack data by creating a CAD in your in your workspace. And because of that, we were forbidding wild cards without cluster admin or system master permissions, actually. So this is the escape path that we keep white cards, but in a secure way. So the identity is something, it's a secret intentionally, and he didn't mention that. The secret is just a random string, uh, secure, uh, securely generated string put in a secret. You as a controller also, you know that. So you have to keep that uh, along, make a backup out of, uh, of it. And you can even move your API export to a different place, copy the secret, and you would get access again to the same old data. Everywhere where we um, replicate this, this identity, we take the hash. So the hash is a SHA-1256, I think, right? So everywhere yeah, it's, like, right now, it's, like, it's just an RSA private key, but could be anything. And then it's yeah. uh, we take the SHA-256 of it. Yeah, it's, it's public private key concept, basically. Yeah, so public one is used in the etcd keys. And we can use a private key. We haven't spec it out completely yet, but we can use a private key for authorization, of course. So if you know the private key, you will get access. If you don't have it, if you, if you lose it, the data is gone. And of course, um, in etcd, you haven't seen uh, shown that right uh, in the in the demo. In oh, etcd, yeah, let me, let me do that real quick. Yeah, that's interesting. I think. Um, so th this is what one of the keys looks like, uh, just for what Stefan was talking about. Like, there's the secret that was automatically generated called dash endpoints, and it's just uh, basics, or you know, it's the encoded RSA private key. And then if I do a SHA-256 on that, it's the identity, but um, so yeah, if we run etcd cuddle, um, I, you'll see a few things in here. I was fiddling around with my, um, 
Kubernetes code. So ignore the first one. That's not actually how it's stored. Uh, this one that's currently highlighted is how this gets stored. So it's slash registry and then the group name and then the resource name followed by a colon with the identity hash. And then the rest of it is the normal um, cluster name, namespace and name of the resource. Uh, and then if anyone is creating just normal CRDs, not using the API exports and API bindings APIs here, those CRDs do not use this pre or suffixing with the um, identity at the end, and they would just show up as normal um, entries. So the, like the one I have highlighted right now for the API resource schema, that is a CR um, for the API resource schema CRD. So you don't see any colon with an identity hash there. I think you're muted again, Stefan. There's another idea we are exploring. If you have breaking API changes and you want, as a controller author, you want to have two informers against the old and the new world, you might be able to, or you can use different identity, a different export. And those have the same resource, uh, resource version, group resource version, but the identity is different. So it's actually a different resource. For the user, it doesn't matter. The user doesn't see it. But as a controller author, you can partition your, your key space and you can run an old controller manager or controller operator, whatever, and the second one, a new one, and the new one just sees the new objects. So those things can be done here. But of course, it's it's in etcd, so it's stored on disk. So you cannot easily switch over. So if you want to switch over to a new identity, that we need some kind of migration. But this, this is not sketched out. If we need that at all, we don't know. Or, or conversions of some sort. Like we we don't have yeah. conversion webhooks enabled. So uh, we're still working on the story for uh, how do we do <laughs> conversions between API versions and um, whether that's like within an existing identity or across two different ones. It's kind of the same problem. Very cool. Great to see, especially the virtual workspace. That's awesome that it was so easy. Yeah, it took me under two hours from, and, and that was going from not having looked at anything that David had written for virtual workspaces to, uh, he pointed me to a couple places to start. I copied the Sinker virtual workspace that he's got in a pull request and just ripped out all the Sinker specific bits and started plumbing in the API export and identity things. And it was pretty straightforward. All right, last chance for questions. Let me switch over. All right, so let's use the last minutes for the usual uh, issue routine, hygiene. That's a list of everything which came in recently, not uh, a couple from, from the last week. So is there anything we should talk about? I start here maybe. Uh, you can skip that one because that's going to be okay. fixed as soon as, well, actually it's kind of already fixed. All right. Yeah, this one, an old one. What I should we do? While you were out. Yeah, mm -hmm. good. So we just need to have a discussion about um, all of this. Like, I I would benefit from a conversation overviewing the proposed APIs for locations and scheduling, and then see how that fit ties into negotiation domains and then the API resource imports and negotiated API resource CRDs that we currently have. Do they fit in? Do they need to change? Do they go away? And what all that looks like. Yeah, so the types look very uh, very similar to the ones you just showed, right? So 
obviously we are thinking about reusing API exports and bindings, but we are hand waving about the life cycle at the moment. So this is something we will talk about. Yeah. So, I mean, it probably makes sense to do this in 05, at least have a plan. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was thinking to try something, some generation of API resource schemas, but of course without life cycle. So pretty static, but as a first step to get resources into a workspace, which uh, is bound to a location domain. So basically to make workload workload clusters and their types available in a different workspace. Yeah. But the life cycle is an interesting bit here, I think. Um, I'm just going to, I'm going to put 05 for the milestone and yeah, that's fine. Yeah, this one's, um, we discovered it um, yesterday or Friday where because of the way that the leader election code is written in client go, it assumes that uh, it can look at the in cluster namespace file and that that's where the locks need to go. So just need somebody to explore how to make this work. Like the, a workaround is in KCP, you create a namespace that has the same name as the automatically created namespace in the workload cluster, the one that's KCP followed by the, the hash of the, of the locator. Um, but that's, that's not elegant because you end up just creating extra namespaces in, um, uh, you know, in KCP that you don't necessarily need. Is this blocking anything at the moment? No, I mean, there, there's there's two workarounds. You either create the namespace with the right name in KCP, or if your controller supports it, you specify the namespace name to use instead of having it read from the in-cluster file. But no, it, so it's, it's not a blocker. It's just, it it's would a, be nicer if this was fixed. Yeah. So backlog and for somebody to pick up. Yeah. All right. I'll put it in. Removing list with context and get with context. Those yeah. were the additional ones, right? We added in our carry package. Yeah, I, I added those. And upon lots of reflection, I don't think we want them anymore. No. So it's a cleanup uh, when we have the external generators, we can get rid of that, right? Yeah. Okay. And there's something about images, inconsistency, builder and co. Yeah, this was just something that was observed and um, we probably should build consistently. Then there's a bug about Go imports, and I saw PR already. So it's not merged yet, but we need to fix yeah, it. Yeah, the um, that PR needs an approve. Yeah. Uh, comment. This feels like a similar case. Um, we have a tool here which depends on stuff, and we call go run, uh, execute go run against this uh, project, I guess, which pulls in dependencies and makes us, forces us to be in sync with this other tool here. That's not a good idea, I think. Uh, other... we're, we're doing that for the bulk of the tool, external tools that we're using. So we could ask for a release and <laughs> grab it from GitHub. We could not use it. We could, um, I don't know. I'm not comfortable if, if dependencies of tools end up in our GoSum. They're not. If this is again, they're, they're not. not? Okay. No. All right, then it's not urgent. 
no, we create a, a fake Go mod for each tool and everything is, okay. is per okay. tool. Cool. All right, next one, I think I also saw PR already. Yeah. So there's permission. So permission is wrong in the directories we create. That comments on it as I saw. So this is nearly done. And what else do we have? Yes, this is a follow up. Maru, are you here? I'm not sure. No, I don't think Joachim might be able to comment. Yes, basically, we need to create the um, the tests for um, the downstream SA feature. We are missing those tests, but okay. I guess there is already another issue about that. I think there is, yes. Just as a heads up, uh, 909 introduces kind right so we get the fixture for kind clusters or for externally provided kind clusters i think that's correct right yes so we can we can run real end-to-end -end tests for everything which needs compute which is pretty cool at the moment we are all faking inside of kcp so we have workspaces which act like an external cube cluster but they cannot do compute obviously so this is a big step. Thanks for pushing that. All right, anything else from the list to point out, to talk about? I just want to mention that there were a lot of things that were in the 0 0.4 milestone that were not blockers. And also just there was no way that they're going to get done in the next um, week and a half. So. I did clear the milestone from several issues and we should find a time to review all issues without a milestone, everything that's currently listed for 0 0.5 and everything that's in TBD, like basically everything that we aren't planning to do for 0 0.4 and just have a full review of, of all of those and close anything that's not relevant anymore and try and get a better assignment of issues to milestones. And then finally, uh, I don't know that we're necessarily gonna get all 42 of these open issues and PRs in for 0 0.4. So if you've got something that you see in here and you wanna change the milestone because it's not required or it's not gonna make it, please add a comment and um, we'll try to chat about it. Should we do a box scrap session maybe next week? I think it would be helpful. Um, yeah. it, there's just, you know, we've accumulated a bunch of stuff and we need to do some housekeeping. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead and find a time maybe next week okay. before or after the call or something like that. All right, so we are at, at the top of the hour. Thanks everybody. Great demos, great progress. And see you next week. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.